The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Um, you know, in some ways, today's class is, you know, it's the most challenging of the semester. These are really complicated, difficult threshold issues, and we're just starting to see the powerful ramifications of having gotten a number of things wrong in this space and what it does. Um, so it's, I try to put the manufacturing stuff in early so you'd see that there are real issues here, not just, you know, kind of abstract science policy questions, but real issues that have big implications. So let me start with Samuelson and you know you're all probably familiar with him but probably among a handful of the most famous economists of the 20th century one of MIT's great stars uh, an amazing figure lived well into his 90s um, you know, I heard him talk when he was, I don't know, just a few years ago before he died, and he was incredibly sharp and funny and astute, uh, just a phenomenal figure. And he really rethought, really was a foundational creator of neoclassical economics, the attempt to bring, you know, disciplined metrics to economic thinking. So then he writes this surprising piece in 2004, which takes on mainstream economics. Now, he had actually done writing on this topic, coming to somewhat similar conclusions much, much earlier in his career. But he comes back to it in this piece. And it's, it took everybody aback, right? Mainstream economics had thought this was a completely settled territory. Um, mainstream economists like Greenspan, Jagesh Bhagwati, Gregory Mankiw, they were arguing, and this is a quote from Mankiw, yes, good jobs may be lost in the short run, but still total U.S. net national product must, by economic laws of comparative advantage, be raised in the long run, and in China, too, never forget the real gains of consumers alongside admitted possible losses of some producers in this working out of what Schumpeter called creative capitalist destruction. Correct economic law recognizes that some American groups can be hurt by dynamic free trade, but correct economic law vindicates the word creative destruction by its proof that the gains of the American winners are big enough to more than compensate for the losers. And then Samuels concludes, the last paragraph can only be innuendo, for it is dead wrong about the necessary supply of winnings over losings. So, you know, here is the guy who created mainstream economics taking on the whole economic mainstream assumption about the benefits and gains of trade. And it's a startling moment. This you know, article was like a bombshell in 2004. So how could the US be a loser in competition with a low wage, lower cost competitor like China, obviously there's others, um, despite David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage? And remember, we talked in the first class about Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. We had the example of Portugal and England. England gets a lot of rain. It has a lot of grass. It grows sheep. Portugal has a lot more sun, a lot less rain. It grows grapes. It produces wine, port. Um, each side trades to their comparative advantage. Now, these, he's thinking of a resource advantage. Right? He's not thinking about a comparative innovation advantage. So what happens in the time from Ricardo to the present is that nations begin building a comparative innovation advantage through building strong innovation systems, right? And arguably the U.S. leads that effort coming out of World War II to develop a comparative innovation advantage. So. 
and Samuelson goes on to argue that if China or another comparable country begins to make productivity enhancing gains in its production and couples that with a wage advantage, it can capture some of the comparative advantage that had belonged to a competitor like the US. So in a Ricardo sense, there's never unemployment that lasts forever from trade. It'll eventually sort itself out, right? But the way in which it's been sorting itself out is that, as he puts it, real wages have been lowered by this version of dynamic fair trade. So to compete, wages come down, right, in the, in the US. And that's, that's what's been going on. Um, so wages can drop after a time to a point where a productivity enhancement or a productivity advantage in another country um, is offset, but these are still net harmful terms of trade. So the, um, and this is not a new story, right? This is a story that's been going on for a long time, Samuelson argues. So farming moves from the eastern part of the United States to the Midwest. You know, that's a straight comparative advantage. Um, the ability to scale up agricultural production in the Midwest as opposed to the uh, more crowded east and hillier east and rockier east, you know, we can see it. We understand why agricultural production shifts to the Midwest. Textile and shoe manufacturing moved from New England to the lower wage south early in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. English manufacturing leadership shifts to the U.S. starting in the middle of the 19th century, right? We develop the early stages of mass production through interchangeable machine-made parts, not Britain, and we'll talk more about that in a later class. So as Samuelson puts it, even where the leaders continue to progress in absolute growth, their rate of growth tended to be attenuated by an adverse headwind generated from lower wage competitors and other technical imitators. In each one of these examples, right? So this is an old economic story that he's raising. So a productivity gain in one country can benefit that country alone while permanently hurting the other country by reducing the gains from trade that are possible between the two countries. And all of this, he acknowledges, is long-run Schumpeterian effects, destructive, creative destruction of capitalism effects. And he concludes that, in effect, there's a roulette wheel of evolving comparative advantage. Now, his warning is a powerful one. If you respond with tariffs and protectionism, you, are, you will be breeding economic arterial sclerosis. You will be limiting your ability to effectively and efficiently compete. So that's not a fix in his mind. So this is, you know, this is one of the most important economists of the last century, and a good part of this, um, weighing in on an historic conclusion that economics came to about the overall benefits of trade and saying it's a much more complicated story than that. Um, so it was a powerful message when he, when he put this out. Um, so I just finished talking about, Shum, uh, about Samuelson. So we're all set up for you to, to do us your view of, this, of Samuelson and lead us in some Q&A. He sounded very um, certain of all of this, right? And, and um, this is something that a lot of people actually ask about as well, is if he's so sure if this is something that's like regarded to be <coughs> You know, pretty pretty substantial. Why did it take the mainstream, and why did it take economists at large um, a lot of ye years to to start changing their mentality? And I remember last week we were talking about the U.S.'s hesitation as a country to change their economic outlook in certain ways. So I was wondering if anyone thought that that those who were later on. So it's kind of two separate questions. Why did it take forever for people to start adopting their views? And does that have something to do with cultural factors in the United States or, or any other factors? Yeah, I have a, a comment, uh, just Lily. I was thinking about the timeline. Did So Sam Samuelson uh, starts to 
put forward in the early, early, early 1970s or even in the 60s, because he got the Nobel Prize in 72, and in his speech he talked Yeah, now this is not the main work for which he's been recognized for, but um, with an economist named Wolfgang Stolfer, uh, the two of them put out a doctrine on advantages and disadvantages of trading regimes, you know, pretty early in their career. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking the 50s, but I have to go back and check the actual dates. So he kind of launches that theoretical, highly mathematical framework. He returns to it in 2004 because, in his view, the mainstream of economics, which, of course, he created, um, has taken, you know, a departing path by assuming the you know, continuing eternal benefits of a free trading system without really analyzing the competitive processes that are going on here. Yeah, and, so and, and just to add one more thing, Lily, um, there's an economist at MIT named David Otter um, who's doing startling work. Um, and I refer to them in, in some of the other readings we got into, but doing startling work on, you know, these very significant trade impacts. Yeah, I listened to some of his interviews. Um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what precipitated Samuelson to write this sort of explosive article. Um, I'm trying to think back. I think um, Alan Greenspan was wasn't he the economic advisor during the Clinton era? So he would have been. No, he was. He was in the Bush. He was. Two regime, right? Okay. Okay. So then NAFTA predated Greenspan, but. Yeah, I'm just wondering about the timing of this article and what really prompted Samuelson to finally be like, listen, everyone, this is completely wrong. But yeah, maybe maybe people weren't paying attention until post NAFTA or other trade agreements and then it started to become really more noticeable. I mean, we discussed before that uh, the US doesn't really respond until things are going south, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, our motto could be, be unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> or I would have loved for Man Mancu to say that to the, you know, that quote, like, okay, yeah, tell that to the losers. <laughs> it's totally fine, don't worry, the winners are going to win higher than the losers are going to lose, so it's okay. <laughs> right, and it's not that there haven't been significant net gains, right? Consumers are, no question about it, significant beneficiaries of, of the regime. Uh, but they're just hard, dramatic effects, is what Samuelson is arguing. I think it's sort of assumed in creative destruction that like the winners win bigger than like the losers are gonna lose, and then you center the winners. Um, I don't know. Maybe we in the U.S. have just been the winners for like a lot of these consecutive creative destruction periods or cycles, um, and then we have to deal with sort of competing productivity rates. I guess, and, uh, and then. Uh, now probably a little bit more of an issue with China, um, and so like you start the losing end like starts expanding uh, towards the U.S. and sphere of influence, which is probably inside of the U.S. And like he writes this in what like 2004, and so like China's really becoming sort of a forefront of what we're considering. And I guess uh, I think Greenspan, I just looked him up. He's like chairman of the Fed at this time, from, like, 87 to 2006. And so he like sees all of this, but he's just probably not in a position to respond. Like you can't really um, kind of shift everybody's opinion here. There's, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, sort of like gravity in like the way that mainstream economics is thinking, and he's just got to follow that, I would say. Um, and then, well, Samuelson doesn't really have any use restrictions or rules, or even say sort of He's got the backing of like having created and the legitimacy of having created mainstream economics. So like, it's, I think it's pretty okay to like disagree with yourself, um, but it's probably a little bit harder to like, disagree with like the massive wave of folks, which is why it might have taken um, even those folks a little bit of time to respond. It's always hard to break the status quo with economics. <laughs> um, well, regarding that winners losers discussion. Um, I think people also mentioned that that sort of thought process might drive a wedge or two that could create income inequality. And um, the question was, does this um, model of international trade, this free trade, inherently create that income inequality? Or are there other things that contribute to that? 
Um, yeah, but what I would add to that is, so maybe we do make more money um, than, than we lose, right? But the distribution will be affected because most likely it will be, I think I made this point last week with um, one of the Intel founders where it was like, you, you end up making way more money, but you're not gonna spread the wealth because those jobs that, that amass the middle wealth aren't here. Um, so I, I think, yeah. And yeah, that was your quote, Martin, from Andy Grove yeah. of Intel. Andy. It was a great quote. Um, and so I think that's a big problem, especially with like Apple, like most of the manufacturing is like outside the US. And the other problem too that we haven't really gotten to is like taxes. Like a lot of times companies use tax loopholes effectively. So maybe that money should be coming here. And I think I made at this point when I was making my notes on this piece is like there's a lot of hidden variables and the author constrained his variables in such a way to make up a certain point. And I think there's a lot of variables that he didn't uh, take into account or like how people actually do things. So theoretically it might work out, but in terms of the actual how it gets done in practice, uh, I don't think that's a good point. Does uh, Otter take into account maybe in his mathematical models um, a couple of these tax loopholes and how people are actually sort of using uh, these systems rather than kind of ignoring them as variables um, to kind of make their point here? Because I wonder like if Otter's analyzing the way that people actually and like effectively use um, these trade laws in this kind of globalized system, like will he arrive at the same result or will he end up getting that income? <coughs> well, like, one of the papers that he wrote looks at specific communities that are like areas that were heavily focused on an industry that's now gone. So it's looking at like real people and how their real incomes have changed. So like I think it's like furniture in North Carolina or something like that. And so you, he can prove just by like looking at that group of people before and after that there has been like income changes and that the support that they're receiving from the government hasn't made up for those changes in income that they're getting. So if you use that as an example, that can show that this income inequality is expanding. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the economists who like or mainstream economists who are promoting globalization, they don't, they don't really, um, wait, when they talk about net, net gains being made, they talk about it on a fair scale. <coughs> uh, they almost necessitate this assumption that it all gets spread out. Uh, we don't necessarily see that, for sure. I do feel like, um, Samuelson, like it was a little bit of a contrived example, but I think that was to the point that what he was doing was uh, specifically showing that um, current ideas about globalization and what was being good isn't always true. And he only really need, needed to pull out a single example there to explain why China and India you know, were um, at a recent point. Just to add, I think that another point um, was that the, a lot of this debate is kind of predicated on the fact that, on the idea of like trickle down, and I think going back to the question of like why now, or why do you this now, um, that it kind of been successively proven that trickle down has some limitations, has a lot of limitations, um, especially considering developments in other countries and how like the market clearing wage rate of the United States has just been subject to like a natural. Um, reduction due to development due to increased capital and innovation in other countries. And so the kind of gap between the rich the rich and the winners and the losers kind of has widened and has made that trickle down process even less So why don't we dive into the next reading, which was Gary Pisano and Willie Shi. And that's yours too, Kevin, right? Okay, great. I'll just summarize very quickly and you can you know, add more, but this is an article they wrote. They later turned this into quite a well-known book. Um, and they, you know, in this article, and they later expand on it, um, they look at a whole set of technology areas, but they start from, you know, the Kindle 2. Um, <laughs> and point out that very large portions of that technology can no longer be produced in the United States. Um, this is the source for a number of the components that it can only be made in various countries abroad. Um, so they argue that there's an eroding US ability to create virtually every brand of notebook computer except Apple and mobile handheld 
uh, designs are now largely in Asia as well. So then they look at a whole series of technology fields, right, and find that there's been a lot of erosion in U.S. leadership in a series of these areas, from advanced materials to computing and communications. They identify fields that are gone, and they identify fields that remain competitive and at risk. Um, same story for energy technologies and storage, for different aspects of semiconductor industry, and for the dis display sector. So the erosion of these industrial capabilities they essentially portray. So they help us take the Samuelson theory and make it much more concrete in terms of actual affected industry segments um, that are no longer you know, present at significant scale in the US. So let me leave it to you, Kevin. It's all yours. Um, well, that's true, yeah. The, the, I think the big focus in the paper was the destructive behavior that outsourcing has caused. And you're right, and like you said, it's um, caused an inability for the U.S. to create right now. Um, and I think um, following our previous talks on how government should inter intervene in these types of kind of situations to sort of fix the issue, um, what role should government play in intervening in company decisions that affect their profits when innovation for the U.S. is the consequence, then the U.S. being able to innovate. that we can't benefit so much as it is that uh, other people are benefiting more, which means that they uh, they can get ahead in other technologies. So if you look at long term, then that puts them ahead in a lot of other fields, and that's just not going to be interest. Mm -hmm. Talk about to that point, yeah. Um, you know, like, it might help in the short term, but in the long term, what happens is, like, they've built up capabilities that we just never had. Um, like, in business, we talk a lot about compound interest. So a lot of the value will be created in the future. So like the problem is more like 10 years in the future, they can produce things that we never built up the capability. And there's those are things that, uh, it's not like knowing, it's like actually creating your supply chain in a certain way and creating the, the system. Like Silicon Valley took like 80 years to become Silicon Valley because it, you need a lot of old capabilities, a lot of mentors, a lot of different um, experiences. Um, and so my big worry when I was reading this more that we, we're very short term focused in the US, like we don't really save, we always assume the future is going to be optimistic. And this is a point from like Peter Thiel, professor, um, since then you kind of like him. Um, that, and like Asian countries tend to be more, uh, let's say, if I think like 30%, 20%, uh, let's take a long term focus. So I think that's really, really like a key point with this piece that we're very short term focused. We're trying to find the big win very quickly. So that's why our industries are kind of like tech, technology that don't matter as much, uh, Wall Street, finance, which debatably doesn't um, and these little industries take a long time, um, but you'll get a lot of capabilities that you won't be able to get. Well, this uh, paper where um, it was Japan that looks like hundreds of years into the future and had that anecdote about uh, an advisor or someone 
he said, oh yeah, this is my plan for the next hundred years, and he was criticized for thinking too short term. <laughs> I think it's interesting also, I, I understand very strongly the, the point you're making about how other countries would then benefit when we move our factories capabilities overseas. But what's the link between if you like moving those processes overseas and making room for new ideas to be born, you know, in like if, if maybe the US takes on more of a innovative and purely like the the idea like blackboard kind of innovation and then ships the idea you know to another country where they can actually produce that like does it does there need to be that separation for us to be able to have the room to innovate or can we still innovate and keep all our stuff here? I think we can innovate. I don't know that the US would like moving most of their profits over to uh, let me just let me jump in with a couple of slides that I was going to use later, but they're relevant, very relevant to this discussion. So this is what the share of employment in services versus manufacturing. So that's the left-hand chart. So services in the U.S. 86 percent, production 14 percent. It's actually somewhat lower than that. Um, and then that's the share of earnings in the Standard & Poor 500 coming from manufacturing versus services, right? So the reason, one reason why you manufacture is that's where the money is, right? It's not in services. So if you develop an economy that's overwhelmingly services, as we have been heading for for a long time, look at the returns, right? And then let's look at, I'm really jumping ahead here, but... Let's look at the trade balance for high technology goods versus all manufactured products. So the US is running a gigantic trade deficit in all manufactured products. But now we're running a major trade deficit in advanced <laughs> manufacturing technologies. So that goes right to your point, Chloe, right? Let's seed commodity production and make it up on the high end, except we're not doing that, right? Instead, the whole picture looks bleak, <laughs> right? This class is designed to scare you to death. Yeah. <laughs> I find that it isn't counterintuitive for U.S. to train so much international students, and knowing that most of them will return to their home country and contribute to the industrial commerce over there. Well, see, that's fascinating because I've heard the assumption actually be that the U.S. keeps the international students, and that's why, I mean, we've mentioned it in several classes, right? But, yeah, they used to, right? I think they might still do. I think they're probably true, but maybe a lesser rate, because I think, like, the opportunity available now that you've exported these sort of manufacturing sectors, right. like, outside the U.S., for people that come here um, and do train, like, it's now a lot more feasible for me to go back. Whereas previously I would have had to stay, and so we're seeing sort of like decreasing rates. It was designed more desirable, more desirable. To stay, right? And like the common example we've used in the class, I think maybe two or three times, is that with every deployment that we received in the US, you should stay for a visa. And that. Heck, let's staple a problem. green card, the heck with the visa. Yeah, it's a green card, sorry. That's, 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 yeah, so I don't, I don't what, what does the data actually look like on that bill? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, a significant portion of students from abroad do stay here, right? But the numbers are in decline and more going back to their home countries. But does that mean you all tell me that the U.S. ought to close its doors to international students, right? Is that what we should do, right? Is that the right economic strategy? We've got somebody who thinks it is at the moment. Yesterday you passed another right? I know. <laughs> no, no, really, I'm asking in, in a serious kind of way. It's, I mean, the, the U.S. model historically was to have these, you know, international universities and attract talent from all over the place because if you're running an innovation system that feeds talent from the entire world, what an incredible competitive advantage, right? What an incredible competitive opportunity. But I think the other side of that coin is that it's, it's, it's a value in itself, and Luya, you really ask some terrific questions um, in your email to me, and this is one of them. Um, you know, what are these Americans doing, right? What do they think they're doing here? Um, but I still think it's of overall value to have as much talent here because that's how knowledge gets sharpened, right? That's how we get sharper and better, and so that would be my argument, but people should feel free to disagree. So to, in a way that, um, 
I feel a little uncomfortable when people say, I want to play the devil's advocate, because I feel like those people are trying to be insidious. But I certainly have had peers in the past that would have raised the point in this conversation about whether students who are coming from other countries might be considered spies, because they would be then understanding knowledge and the innovation or sort of innovation paradigm and then taking it back to their home countries. And that also makes me feel uncomfortable because I feel like trust sort of precludes cooperation and it precludes the United States' ability to work in a globalized system. So I was hoping that you could talk about that a little as well. You know, in the end, having you know, a world talent base with common education experiences, that's very powerful for the world in general. I mean, that's a real huge net plus. And, you know, we can't assume that all innovation is gonna happen in the United States and we can wall ourselves off. It's important for innovation to occur elsewhere. There's an old, there's an old story about um, small towns and lawyers. So if there's a small town and there's one lawyer, the lawyer's going to starve. If there's a small town and two lawyers, they're both going to get rich, right? Because their clients will be suing each other constantly, right? In other words, they're going to create more net, right? And you know, if China is doing brilliant things to bring 300, 400 or more million people into its middle class, that's a great thing for the world. That's a great overall incredible net plus to, to create a massive new middle class. Um, and if the U.S. can't figure out how to, you know, take advantage of that, then, you know, shame on us, right? Because it's really important that the world do these things, right? Same story in India, same story in all kinds of other developing countries that are starting to become emerging economies. So these things need to happen. And, you know, we're not going to be able to wall them off. Um, we just have to figure out to develop our own competitive capabilities to be participating. That would, that would be what I would argue. Now, a lot of people see this differently. Matthew? I think another benefit, like even if you didn't care about you know, China's middle class or India's middle class, it, uh, like if you just cared about the U.S., you'd still have to recognize that we don't have the comparative advantage in everything. So if advanced manufacturing, by having those international students there, like you said, a Sloan student who you know, was working in manufacturing in China, just as much as they're maybe benefiting from kind of the U.S. education and that innovation mindset, they're sharing with their peers their experiences. Yeah, I think that's important. And when we consider like the educational model and bringing international people into that, it's, I think it's important to not adopt the perspective that well, we're, we're the only ones who have anything to offer. You got it. Uh, you know, other people bring other perspectives, right. and, and that's valuable, even just for our benefit, not to mention other countries' benefit, which is good. <laughs> So, Louis, Lu have you, we answered your question? Yeah? Are you satisfied with what we've talked about here? You can critique us. Right. Um, personally, I think it is just for the sake of the world, it's better feeling to have international base of talents. And there are countries see this as a national uh, strategic move to have to attract talents. Mm -hmm like Singapore, but because they are such a small country and their only resources um the human talents, but then I don't know if U.S. see this as a, like of something of international, uh, national importance. Right. Then, Your Singapore example is very astute. It's really interesting because Singapore, at least until fairly recently, had a strategy for higher education, in particular graduate education, to get its students out into the world. Right, to send them to the best educational institutions around the world so that they would learn other countries and how they worked and what ideas could be gained from them. Um, and that they would be able to set up relationships with those countries. They would be able to have working relationships with the communities that they learned. Um, and Singapore, you know, small island nation, um, city-state, really, no real resources, they have to trade to live. So they organize themselves around 
becoming intermediaries in all kinds of trading activities worldwide, whether it's you know petroleum and oil and, and fossil fuels, or it's running the, the world's most efficient port, or running the most efficient you know cargo transport aircraft operation in the world. They figured out these intermediary spots and then they used their relationship building to be able to build the relationships they needed to play that dramatic intermediary role benefited by their geography. So it's a very interesting example you know, of a country that's adopted a kind of a broad look at education and where to get it. Please. Like, like local hatred against international labors and this conflict, the government takes the responsibility to settle this conflict in, instead of reducing international talents because they see this as a, like, a strategic move. And so it is the question that when we see maybe um, there's a outsourcing of manufacturing, um, there are um, lots of Loss of talents, or do we do we just stop doing it, or should the government take the responsibility to solve the social costs that associate with this kind of move, mm -hmm. like together with globalization? Have at it, team. What do you think? I mean, so a point of education, higher education, that's one of the U.S.'s capabilities. It's dangerous to assume that's, that's going to be a poor strength for a long period of time. Um, because the people who learn from us and then go to other countries. Uh, there's a couple like good universities popping up in other countries that are doing really well. Um, I think the big danger, though, is the point you made previously about like, why I should the manufacturing over there and create more value. It's because ideas don't matter as much as like the execution of ideas. Like, Mark, like there's a ton of people who came up with social networks. Like, Facebook had 15 social networks beforehand. But it wasn't until one person executed it right. So the danger is like we can invent something here, and another company like in China has. He's like, oh, that's a great idea. I was just, we can do that. We can do it better. We can do it cheaper. And that's the real kind of thing I would worry about is like that capability of being able to execute. And it's something that's not very uh, like it's hard to understand until you see it just happen. Um, and like uh, gone through it. But that's that's the thing. So Kevin, how about another question, a closing question on Gary Pisano and Willie Shi. This was a throughout this whole discussion. This, this might be beyond the scope of the class. This question I'm popping into my head: If there stands to be so much mutual benefit from global cooperation, why don't countries prioritize it? Like that might be an idealistic view, um, but if economies now are so interconnected by trade and competition, and everything, why don't governments of the world cooperate to sort of prop each other up? And I'm a cynical as the next person, right? I understand greed and the desire for money, right? Desire to be the best. But why can't everyone sort of be the best? <laughs> so, like, uh, often the people who have to make these decisions, they, uh, they usually want to put their people first. Like, hey, America first. Uh, so that usually means it's America first at the cost of anyone else. So if you have 196 governments, all of which were thinking of that, then, well, you kind of end up with that today. And it is, it's short term, yes. And I'll try to play a bit of devil's advocate. I know you hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Honestly, the, I love the, that. The, the intellectual, it as an intellectual exercise, I think, is important. Yes. But if you do it from not a place of trying to find an understanding with other people, then there's So I see the, uh, what was it? I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> global corporate. Um, yeah, so I see uh, I see why the uh, a lot of these countries might I, I see why long term it would be good for to cooperate, but in the short term, if somebody say reneges on a deal uh, when you've already put billions and billions of dollars into it, that could hurt you significantly, and then they could get away scot free, and then they could realize, hey, I've damaged this country that I don't know for whatever reason I wanted to uh, I wanted to have 
less economic benefit than what I'm getting. Uh, so it's basically, it comes down to mistrust. So like that could happen. Yes, we are the world. I'd love to it happen, but I think it's gonna take a long time. So like to point out, like you definitely done a really negative thing a billion times. Uh, yep. Colonialism exists. Uh, so <laughs> like we've definitely gone to countries um, at different places around the world really just ravage for resources. Um, during watch movies, like what have you. And then I think there's a, like a long standing history of us kind of doing that and not doing it right. Um, just because it is so advantageous for like one party uh, to renege or sort of do it wrong and go into the wrong reasons in the first place. And I think that level of trust is sort of hard to build from that history, but also in the case of an actual saying, so like let's say you build this multinational um, cooperation and somebody does sort of renege on a deal, um, there's, I can't see really like a conflict mediation uh, piece or a medium there that doesn't involve, um, that doesn't escalate very quickly, especially when large economic uh, threats are involved, so like maybe war or something like that. And, uh, war is the extreme example, but like tariffs, or, like, uh, there could be large trade implications. That now, whereas previously it would have been isolated to like one or two countries, now that it's multinational effects sort of the like, I'm trying to think of a memoir I was reading recently about a woman named uh, Wangari Mata in Kenya about her experiences uh, growing up right as British colonialism was taking off in the 1940s. And she was speaking of the ways in which so society had been structured in her village in that different ethnic groups had become, uh, had spent, I guess, specialized in certain capacities. Like some people were very good at basket weaving, other people had become very good at uh, agriculture, other people had become very good at medicine. And each of those communities taught themselves those trades and perpetuated that sort of, I guess, capacity within generations. And then British colonialism came in, they started exploiting people for agriculture, agricultural production. And that entire system imploded, and along with it, you know, went against culture, the knowledge that they had, the agricultural system that had taken a thousand years, you know, thousands of years to formulate, etc. And I think it's precisely, you know, what this woman is talking about why cooperation is so difficult, which is why I brought up game theory, I think, two classes ago, because cooperation is, and collaboration are so important, but they rest so much on a, a sort of fundamental trust, and that kind of collaboration always sort of implies a power imbalance that is negated by that sense of trust. And it's so difficult on a global scale to enact trust and collaboration because there is such obsessive histories of colonialism, of power imbalances, of domination and hegemony. And because we have been, for the past you know, 200 years in the United States, such strong actors in that we've never had to take this into consideration before. And I think now in particular, I really wish that we had more students in this course who were sort of coming from defense backgrounds because I feel like we don't talk enough about the implications of war and the implications of bioterrorism. But I do think it's certainly important to think about collaboration as our ideal, but as we were talking about last week in the social organization of organizations, how is it that we can sort of have a layered approach where there is collaboration existing in a system where we feel that we are respecting power dynamics and also the potential for us to be heard in the short term. Yeah, because when I think of collaboration between nations, the like first example that comes to me is like World War One axis versus like allies. Like they were great collaboration teams, and then that embroiled us into like a massive mess because fights between one and each led to fights between all of them. So I think you raised the issue of that covering. Um, I actually didn't comment on that. Uh, the difference between now and World War One is uh, currently. Uh, as uh, we saw last, in the last week's readings, our, uh, our economy is so linked, we can't have that again. Because then the entire world would just completely collapse. Because, and honestly, like you probably can't even have the war because you need uh, the gunpowder produced, I don't know, in one country. You need the bullet casing produced in another country. The uh, stock for a rifle built in a third country. It's just, everything is so interconnected, as was pointed out, that, well, can't even like mobilize very well. Well, right, So I, I'm gonna. <laughs> don't care. I'm gonna. Everyone gets stiff. I'm gonna put us back into manufacturing <laughs> and out of war. Uh, but let me. I'm gonna go to the opposing view though. There, there's a lot of value in conflict. Like in management, you do this a lot. Where it's like 
um, you will put out something to make it seem like you're doing bad when you're actually doing okay so that people get to work. Um, like, I think a good example was um, like in Silicon Valley, somebody made out a white paper about like, oh, this is like how the, the distribution of diversity. And a lot of times it's very logical, but it's actually like the people that, the person we don't expect because they want people to focus on that, that uh, topic. Um, so I think you get a lot of, there's a lot of value from creating that conflict. So I think on the macro, I think we are in a relative peace. Is it ever gonna be a time of no, like, no conflict at all, right? It's like too utopian. So what you do is like it's macro utopian, but like you create these like minor issues that really don't matter. Maybe. <laughs> Let me, Kevin, why don't you give us a closing thought on this piece? Well, um, to count on those points, it's hard to tell, especially in the long, long term, which is more sustainable, our historical behaviors or whatever future model we come up with. Um, but maybe the next big innovation way for the US is a global one and not just one unique to the country. Interesting. All right, we'll now dive into Jonas Nam and Ed Steinfeld, both of whom worked at MIT. So Jonas is now teaching at Johns Hopkins Seiss. Um, and he's from Germany, fluent in Mandarin, spent lots and lots of time in China. So he knows both German and Chinese economics and then manufacturing systems in particular. Ed Steinfeld has gone on to head the Watson Institute at Brown from MIT Political Science Department. Both, both are terrific scholars of um, the kind of manufacturing advances that China has been able to put together. Uh, so, you know, this dramatic thing happens. China moves from 5.7% of global manufacturing output in 2000 to, you know, almost 20% in 2011, passing the U.S. in output. I mean, that, that is startling. Right, that is, that is a number that, those numbers jump off the page. How did that happen, right? So what happened here? So the operating assumption in the US has been that China had lower production costs due to lower wage costs um, and lower cost parts. That was the operating assumption. And then there's been an assumption in the US that manufacturing naturally migrates to low cost producers and that the knowledge required for manufacturing processes is comparatively trivial. And Nam and Steinfeld argue neither of those is true. The assumption that production knowledge flowed via multinationals from outside into China, it's a much more complicated story than that. The assumption that the IT revolution enables severing of manufacturing from R&D, from production and design, um, and you know, is, turns out to be a more complicated story. So, and none of these explanations explain that dramatic rise in China's production capability and output. Um, instead, they argue that China has developed some remarkable new um, process innovation and manufacturing innovation, and that, and that needs to be understood uh, and respected as a major innovation advance. So China has tended, they argue, to specialize in rapid scale up and cost reduction in combination. Um, and they join really remarkable skills in simultaneous management of the tempo of production and production volume um, and controlling cost. And that that's a very powerful set of skills and capabilities. And that these kinds of factors are much better explanations for that remarkable rise than simply you know, a wage differential. Um, so they argue that this has enabled China to expand even in industries that are highly automated or not on governmental priority lists. Um, and low costs and government support are just not sufficient to explain China's remarkable accomplishments in manufacturing. So let's get more into a little detail here. China's developing production processes that were previously in areas that were previously thought fully mature and impervious to additional 
cost reductions or technological improvement. China has taken on various sectors and shown that, in fact, you can bring innovation to these in process and in cost. Um, so the key has been accumulation of firm-specific expertise that has enabled what they call extensive multi-directional inter-firm learning. In other words, they're able to get a community of producers to operate together in a unified kind of way that's kind of unthinkable in the much more fragmented, decentralized U.S. system. To build a level of cooperation, particularly on a regional basis, that is able to scale that production very quickly um, in ways that are pretty, um, pretty unprecedented. So elements of China's new production model, they argue, include backward design capability, in other words, taking an existing product and rethinking it right, so that you can create lower cost production systems for those components and therefore be able to sell it into a lower cost, lower wage Chinese economy, right, in a creative kind of way here. Um, yes, there's been a partnership of foreign design and Chinese manufacturing, but that has been multi-directional, they argue. Both sides have been informing each other. And Technology absorption and collaborative development across networked production firms has been remarkable. That's part of this ability to do rapid scale up. So these are all new elements um, that we haven't seen in production systems that China's been able, they argue, to put together in unique ways. So an explanation of Chinese manufacturing is just a wage advantage completely understates, they argue, what in fact China's accomplished here. It's a remarkable story. So we have to kind of keep this in mind as we you know, confront these global competitive issues in the, in the class today. It's not a simple story of a wage advantage. It's a much more complex and interesting and innovation-based story. It went pretty into detail about why China was so successful, why it could do things in such a short time span. Um, but my question, and the question some people had as well, was what next in terms of trade relations between, economic relations between the U.S. and the United States, especially in this political climate? Are, are they uh, forced to be reckoned with? Are we going to learn from them? So actually, like part of my thinking is that maybe uh, they had such a rapid growth because if you think about it, they have a lot of people and they have a lot of resources. So I mean, Untapped they just people. have yeah, they have just haven't tapped their potential until relatively recently. The fact that they were able to do it so quickly is pretty remarkable. But uh, beyond that, the uh, the fact that they are where they are now should not be that surprising. I feel that they have uh, yeah, I feel like they have. A, easy to do it, and the internet's made the information pretty easy to get, so uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe like all manufacturing secrets you can easily get, but. Yeah, I do think kind of in line with the Speed Brothers is perception that if we weren't buying manufactured goods from China, we could just make them in the U.S., but that's pretty clearly not true, especially as emphasized by a lot of these readings, like we simply can't make them anymore. So I see that there can be a lot of talk about not purchasing as many goods from China, but if we want to <coughs> maintain our lifestyles, have Kindles, have these other devices, I don't see a realistic way in the short term for us to not have some dependence on China. Like long term, we could change our system and try to gain back some of that footing, but I think a lot of it is just talk right now. And digging into like why China has the advantage here, I think it's two things, mostly because um, work and kind of their life has been very integrated. For example, at factories, like semiconductor factories, you live in dorms and you go to work. Um, and it's very, there's not that much separation between like your work and your actual life. Um, so there's a very much an expectation that you are very devoted and dedicated to your work. And also I think um, in China, it's less um, stigmatized to go into like kind of manufacturing um, and kind of work on these really innovation 
driven from manufacturing kind of in a reverse process. And so that means like a lot of the academics there aren't afraid to go into these fields, which is important because, um, especially in a field like semiconductors, you need a lot of technical expertise, even though it might just be manufacturing. If you want to make those improvements, make them faster, smaller, et cetera, you have to be able to have that background to innovate further, and I think that's um, why a lot of these firms have been having success, taking that extra step beyond just learning from the innovations posed by other countries. Um, and I think this might be a little bit controversial, but I think the government structure in China also has had a big role in why they are able to you know, make that happen so quickly, because they're able to come up with an idea and turn it around really quickly because it's very integrated and more unilateral as opposed to you know our structure here. So like if they have a construction project, like they want to make a bridge happen, it'll happen in a year. For like in the US, it'll probably take like three years. Or yeah, if that, and it might not even happen. Um, well, that's true. Uh, the directed focus of a government definitely has some advantages. Like if you want something done, it gets done. But uh, on the other, there are plenty of disadvantages too. Like you need disagreement. So it might end up being a bridge that points upward for no reason. So then it's not actually useful, even if, oh yeah, we got it done really quickly and really under budget, it doesn't actually uh, solve the problem as well as it could, whatever the problem might be. Kevin, why don't we lead you back into this? How, how are you reacting to these comments? Uh, so, not only with discussion with this paper, but other papers, we've been discussing short versus long term in terms of what direction the nation might head uh, in terms of innovation. Speaking in the short term now, what do people feel the U.S.'s reaction will be? To <laughs> uh, yeah, can we fast forward maybe like one slide, two slides? Just to, no, one more, please. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, um, so I think there is an opportunity here um, in the second point for this partnership of four design and Chinese manufacturing. Um, rather than kind of walling ourselves off in the short term, we can kind of just accept that they have uh, this, I don't even want to say like, like built up advantage, but they've actually constructed a system that we've just learned is like super effective at doing what they do. And so like, rather than um, kind of copying the Chinese model, which will take structurally a lot more time, it might even be impossible because we're so fragmented, or like kind of walling ourselves off, I think it just might be important to just like, capture um, on this partnership of foreign design and Chinese manufacturing and like facilitate that multi-directional learning. Um, so hopefully some of those guys will come back. But at the end of the day, I think like, uh, if I sprout a mustache and glasses and a tie while I say this, it's okay. But uh, <laughs> you're gonna have to just look towards like what's the next piece of, or what's the next innovation wave so that we can kind of capture us on those and then hope that those don't all go to China because I think we've kind of already lost the ball on what they've done with factory design and these network production firms, how they do things. We'll come back to that, Rashid, when we talk about these advanced manufacturing partnerships. I agree only in small part with you on that. So, because I think we need to be really careful in the short term because we do maintain the capability of, so for example, in this paper, thin film solar cells. We can do that in the United States. Problem is, in China, the Chinese government is dumping subsidies. So yeah, that's marginally legal or even illegal, but how long is it going to take us to work that out in an international court? So we need to very much forge ahead with or, or, or protect what we can so here. I agree with you that we need to uh, understand that there are some things that China does better, maybe even adopt some of their practices, but we. We need to protect what we can still do, I think, because we don't want to lose the entire solar market and then they take their subsidies away and we could have competed, you know what I mean? Two questions? Or two things I want to bring up. One, uh, I didn't realize that, is it illegal to subsidize your own industry? In a lot of trade agreements, there are rules about what you can do. Yeah, they're, they're there are anti-dumping rules. In other words, yeah. can you dump on a foreign market? 
a good that's produced at, and sold at less than its cost to produce, right? So that's where you begin to run into issues. Internationally, they're ruining the ability of other countries to produce, and then when they take those subsidies away, it's no longer, they're no longer you know, cheaper or better. They're just the only thing that they're not Right, but remember too, Lily, that, that China is selling its solar capability into its own market because of its own staggering demand sure. for power resources. So, you know, this is not entirely an attempt to, you know, capture world solar markets. This is serving a pretty strong need in its own uh, power development areas. Um, from the Chinese market preference perspective, um, there's this mysterious preference for foreign goods, especially U.S. made products, over our China, like made in China goods. So I do see that U.S. still has this advantage. Like, if, like for example, if there's two medicines for you to choose, there's one made in China and one three times more expensive, but it's made in the U.S. People who are looking for it, just buy it, like, without any reason. So, I do think... That's fascinating. It's interesting. My kind of point is, is that way for now, for the sake of innovators to learn on to the strategy in business, which it is you make the product that isn't that great, but it's cheaper, and then you... And what happens if you do that specifically so your competitors don't attack you? It's the, it's the equivalent of, like, um, say you're at a dinner table and there's something you need to have, right? You play for somebody who needs, like, Okay, so a closing thought, Kevin, on this great debate you've kicked off here. <laughs> Well, these next four years are going to be interesting. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be very interesting. Oh, well, uh, sorry. I didn't remember my second thought. <laughs> Feel free. Yeah, that happens. I, uh, so, I was thinking back to the Korean War, um, and I think that Korea was really good at that. Um, and I think that there are differences between our government and Chinese government. Uh, I think one of the differences that comes in, I'm not certain about Chinese government. I don't know, um, are there term limits? Are there some limits built into these government positions that uh, say forcing them to be elected every so often? I think probably, but it's longer, right? Which is every other four years? It's always elected for Really? Okay. Did you think that they're elected? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, me neither. Is that really elected? Okay, okay. So it's a dictatorship. <laughs> okay. All right. Then that, Go ahead. Yeah. Then my point <laughs> being to that would be that well, uh, then the governmental officials can think a lot more long term uh, because the way that our current electoral system is uh, made, people have uh, they well at least uh, representatives have to think like two years in advance, and that's basically the most they can think of. They need to produce results within that very short time period. Sen um, senators, they have six years. Uh, president, if he's lucky, he gets eight. Uh, so the, uh, there's just a different emphasis on uh, what the governments are able to do and what they're incentivized to do. So with that, if we were to try to adopt that kind of uh, structure, we'd have to make some radical changes to the Constitution <laughs> and uh, a lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's hard for democracies to think longer term. Yes. All right, so we're going to dive into Suzanne Berger's work on the production and the innovation economy studies. So we talked last class about her work on distributed production. And she led this big study at MIT, the Pi study, production and the innovation economy. Uh, pulled together a whole faculty group from a variety of fields and ended up with this, you know, in-depth, you know, two-volume study of what had been happening in U.S. production. And it's, you know, I think there's some very important stories here. I had you read the kind of preliminary report. The, the depth 
you know, in the two volumes is really quite powerful. So if you want to read further in this area, this is a great place to start. So Suzanne's, Suzanne wrote the kind of cover overall view, drawing on chapters that particular faculty members and researchers you know, pulled together in different segments, and then she did the kind of overview piece. The overview piece is you know, one of the most powerful books, in my view, that's been written about US manufacturing. Um, so well worth, well worth uh, thinking about. You're just getting a kind of early snapshot, frankly, uh, from the preliminary report I had you read. But I want to try and pull out, frankly, blending the preliminary report with my knowledge of the underlying report, uh, some stories that I think help us understand you know, what's been going on in US manufacturing. Um, and she tells a series of these in her book. Um, one story is that manufacturing turns out not to be agriculture. And I'll explain what in heaven's name I'm talking about in a minute. Um, secondly, that our manufacturing firms are increasingly, as she puts it, home alone. That small, mid-sized, and startup firms are having a lot of trouble scaling up their production in the US. A fourth story is about if you want to keep strong innovation, you need to think about the link between innovation and production, which is, this book argues, is profound. Um, that there's a real link between innovation and, pr and production. Uh, there's deep workforce training education issues. There's important lessons from Germany. And then there's some very interesting jobs stories here, too. So let me try and tell these quickly. <coughs> First, you know, manufacturing is not agriculture. For a long time, the economists thought that manufacturing was agriculture. In other words, in 1900, you know, half the population, not quite, but half the population was farming. And, you know, now less than 2% of the population is farming, and we're producing much, much more. Right? So it's a story of staggering productivity gains and advances. But the MIT report takes that argument apart. So economists were saying, oh, this is just productivity gains. We're just much more efficient in production. So what if you lost one third of your manufacturing jobs between 2000 and 2010? No problem, productivity gains, right? But then the story turns out to be much more complicated. Um, we thought that manufacturing output was holding firm, but it turns out that it wasn't. Right? So we thought we were producing the same with less labor, but it wasn't the case. In fact, in 15 of 19 industrial sectors, we had output decline, and our official statistics overestimated output because we adopted a view of computing and IT technologies that assumed the components, for definitional reasons, were produced in the United States. But they weren't, right? That's the Willie She, uh, Gary Pisano story, right? So we were completely inflating our numbers, and output wasn't what we thought it was. Um, so if output, which is obviously half the story of productivity, is not what you thought it was, then the productivity numbers were considerably lower than mainstream economics had been telling us. It's not that there weren't productivity gains in that period, but there, there were. But they weren't what we thought they were. So instead, the job loss numbers really tells us the sector, the sector is hollowing out, not getting more productive. So a second story, what Suzanne calls the home alone story. So she tells a story that for the last several decades, we've been thinning out in the US our manufacturing sector. We used to have firms and supply chains that had to be very vertically integrated. This is the story we told last week about Legos and model airplanes, right? Uh, we hit on a financial model, and Martine, you've been pointing some of this out. We hit on a financial model that emphasized quarterly returns, which led us to want to reduce interim risk, which led us in the financial sector to focus on getting firms to nurture their core competency, not do a lot of other stuff. So therefore, they should go 
what's called asset light. Strip the firm of, of assets that are not part of its core competency. Right? So we began to thin out what had been these very vertically integrated uh, groups of firms. So the companies in the system are now much more home alone. Story number three is related. This is the scale up problem. So the US is home to you know, a, a large percentage of the world's multinationals. They're global, they can get production efficiencies by producing in lower cost countries, and they need to be in global markets. They don't have an option here, they need to be worldwide. Um, generally speaking, they're okay. They're producing more abroad. Uh, than they did in the past, but there's two much more vulnerable sectors. So one of those sectors are what we could call, what the book calls, Main Street firms. So these are the small and mid-sized firms. So they're between 250,000 and 300,000, let's call it 250,000 of these small and mid-sized firms that employ less than 500 people. That is most of the manufacturing sector. That's a majority of U.S. production. Um, they have trouble getting scale-up funding. They are thinly capitalized. They have to be risk-averse to survive. They don't do what we would consider R&D, um, although they can be very innovative in modifying products and changing processes, but they don't do what we would consider you know, innovation-based research. Um, so they're kind of outside of the U.S. innovation system. And there are a lot of them. It's a big part of this. For them to innovate, they have to have access to ideas, which they don't necessarily have in a thinned out ecosystem. Um, and they've got to have the financing to scale up. Part of the production of the innovation economy study uh, was led by John Reed, who was um, head of the MIT Executive Committee and former chairman of Citicorp, a brilliant, famous banker who created you know, a lot of the amazing Citicorp model. Um, John Reed was part of these deliberations, and he said, yes, we ended local banking in the United States. But it was the historic era where your neighborhood banker would know in your city or town who the quality producers were and know, and know who to lend to, that's gone. We substituted um, really national and then international financing models. And we replaced that kind of face-to-face -face kind of relationship-based banking to a very significant extent. <coughs> the Main Street firms were dramatically affected by their ability to get scale-up money out of their banking system, right? It really hit them. Uh, and there isn't really a substitute for them. And then meanwhile, and we'll talk about this more later in class, you know, the other manufacturing community is entrepreneurial startups that want to make something, that want to make a hard technology. Um, unfortunately, the venture capital system has walked from this territory. So venture capital at this point in the U.S. funds predominantly software, secondarily biotech, then a series of service sectors like media, entertainment, business services. Uh, they're not funding firms that want to make something, that have hard technologies. So the implications of this are really quite powerful. That's part of the reason why Raphael Reif put the engine together down the street, because a lot of MIT developed hard technologies which is not getting out we had to have a different way to stand them up. But this is where the next generation of manufacturing will come from. This is what the next generation of manufactured goods will come from. And we're not doing it. Right? Big time societal implications here. So there's a big scale up problem for these two. Right? How are you going to scale up innovative production and innovative technologies? We're in trouble to the extent we rely on them. We rely on them a lot. This is just a chart that shows who does the R&D. So large companies do R&D, small companies don't. Right? So the small companies are just not part of the innovation system. Um, story four, the relationship between innovation and production. So 
you know, what's wrong with scaling up abroad? The, the issue is that for most products, not all products, and it looks like there's a lot of exceptions in the IT area, but for most products, you need your innovation pretty closely related, particularly to your initial production stage. In other words, there's a lot of interchange as you design for production. You take your idea and you design it for production, right? It's a very creative process. Lots of engineering. You often have to rethink your basic science. So if you're shifting your production capability abroad, and this is the most important conclusion of the Pi study, you're starting to affect your innovation capability. So the US has thought that its competitive advantage really since the end of World War II is in a strong innovation system. But if it's shifting production, particularly initial production, it's losing that interaction between initial production and its innovation capability. Um, so a fifth story is how do you begin to wrestle with these issues? They looked hard at workforce. So there's lots of workforce studies out, and they consist of CEOs saying, we don't have enough skilled workers. And the MIT approach, led by Paul Osterman, uh, a faculty member at Sloan, said, look, let's not ask the CEOs, right? Um, the CEOs may be saying, um, there's a tremendous shortage of $10,000 Cadillacs, right? That may be what they're, in effect, saying. In other words, what they're prepared to pay for skills is not an appropriate compensation for the skills. It doesn't match markets. So let's actually ask the human resources departments. And let's not ask them, are you short of skilled workers? Let's ask them, how long did it take you to hire for positions that have come up in your firm? And what they found was that 75% of the firm studied, and they reached way over 1,000. I think it was several thousand they were able to hire within one month. Now, that's logical because, after all, we just laid off almost six million production workers, right? And they've been largely shunted into lower-end service sectors. Maybe they would want to come back. So presumably, there's a surplus of capability out there. But the most interesting part of what they what they found was that for 25% of the firms, they weren't able to hire in a month. It was taking them a lot longer. And interestingly, these tended to be the smaller, more technology-focused, innovative technology-focused firms. Um, and they were having a much harder time, actually, because they needed a higher skill raft of workers. They were having a lot of trouble hiring in a reasonable time frame. So there's no, Paul Osterman would summarize saying there's not an immediate emergency here on workforce skills, but we're going to have trouble ahead. And that the signal is the 25% of more innovative firms that are having more trouble getting the skill sets that they needed. And look, we've got a big demographics problem. So the manufacturing workforce is an aging workforce, and it's going to be need replacing. Sixth story, and there's only one more to go after this. What can we learn from Germany? So the US has been sitting around for at least a decade, more like 20 years, thinking, oh, we have to lose manufacturing jobs because we're high wage and high cost. So we have to lose these jobs. Somebody never sent that memo to Germany. They failed to get that word. Right? Because Germany is much higher wage and higher cost than the United States. Their wages and benefits are 66% higher than, for their manufacturing workers than for US manufacturing workers. And they are running staggering trade surpluses with everybody, including a major trade surplus with Germany. I mean, with China, excuse me. What are they doing? They're supposed to lose this sector, right, according to our thinking. But they didn't. So the US is about 8% of its workforce in production jobs. Germany, 20%. What are they doing? Right? This is an important set of lessons here. What, how has Germany organized its manufacturing sector so that it's able to run an extremely successful um, 
manufacturing sector that continues to bring major returns back to its economy, even though it's very high wage and high cost. What are they doing, right? So there may be important lessons for us to learn. And the Pi study, in fact, went through a number of these. Uh, they found that unlike the US, which was thinning out its ecosystem for its manufacturers, that its small and mid-sized manufacturers in particular were more home alone, Germany was doing the opposite. A much more connected collaborative system, right? In part through a Fraunhofer network system that brought, starting at the end of World War II, and partially, by the way, paid for by the Marshall Plan by the US, brought large and small and mid-sized firms. In Germany, the small and mid-sized firms are called Mittelstadt, and it's a famous German capability, these very talented small and mid-sized firms. Uh, they were able to bring them together in collaborations around new innovations in production. And they would work together assisted by German engineering academics um, in the process. They have 60 of these Fraunhofer institutes, really manufacturing institutes, you know, spread all over the country. So they have a way of avoiding the home alone problem. If anything, they're ever enriching the collaboration between their firms and the trade-off of ideas. Um, they have a whole system for collaborative R&D that's shared between the small and mid-sized firms and the larger firms. Through that system, they have you know, the most famous workforce training system in the world through a remarkable apprenticeship system that consistently produces incredibly highly skilled workers. Um, and the apprenticeships will last for three or four years, right? Really in-depth training. We have nothing like that. We have highly decentralized labor markets in the United States. We have nothing close to this. Uh, so they have a whole shared training system for their workforce. And they've developed ways through these collaborative mechanisms to rapidly scale up their production. So, you know, Germany's workforce in manufacturing is 80% unionized. You know, we're not remotely close to that. It's a different system. It's hard for the US to do an apprenticeship system here. It doesn't quite match the way we organize things. But there are some ideas that we could learn from. And the seventh and last story is that is about jobs. The manufacturing sector affects our services sector. And Suzanne Berger and the team tell an interesting story here that the 21st century firm, right, is going to increasingly tie a complex hard product to a service and link them and offer customers solutions, not a good or a service, but a solution to a problem. So, you know, your Apple iPhone in many ways is a combined service delivery hardware technology, right? There's lots of service delivery through that Apple iPhone, right? Things are gonna be more like that in the future. Um, now, personal services tend to be face-to-face and they're hard to scale up quickly, right? It's their kind of one-to-one -one relationship building and that process takes a long time. Whereas if you're producing a manufactured good, you can produce you know, one product on day one, on day 12 you can produce a million products, right? You can scale very quickly, much faster than through a personal service operation. Right? So one advantage of manufacturing is that it tends to scale up the gains in your economy much more quickly. Part of the reason why it took so long to recover from the 2007-2008 recession is that we had so damaged our manufacturing sector that the normal scale up coming out of a recession just wasn't happening, it was taking forever. But if you're able to combine a tradable good right, that can scale with a service, then the service starts to become tradable as well, right, and can scale. So that's a whole new capability in services that we haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about, but it's very interesting since 86% of our workforce is in services. Maybe we ought to work on this territory, but a prerequisite 
is having the tradable goods that you can tie to a service, right? Yet another reason why in the next generation of firms, manufacturing capability is gonna be important. Um, you saw this chart before. This shows you where societal returns come from, right? Predominantly from production, not from services. So let me just summarize. Here's the stories that Suzanne and the Pi study taught us. Manufacturing is not agriculture. This sector was hollowing out. It wasn't enjoying productivity advances uh, to the extent we thought possible. Our manufacturing firms are increasingly home alone. Their ecosystems of support are thinned out. There's less of what uh, Pisano and she called a commons available to support them. There's a real scale-up problem for small, mid-sized firms and for startup firms for somewhat different reasons. Um, there's important linkage between innovation and production. These are very related and tied to each other, and if you lose one, it'll affect the other. Um, there's interesting lessons about workforce that we've got a problem ahead in upskilling our workforce. It's not an emergency now, but we probably have a problem ahead. Very important lessons from Germany on the societal benefits of a strong production sector. Um, and then in this jobs area, if you're able to tie tradable goods to services, then the services themselves become tradable and scalable as well. And then, you know, there's an underlying question about how our manufacturing sector therefore affects our services sector. So let's come back and do some questions about this and then we'll dive into the next round of readings and Steph will lead us in those.